This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Rand Fishkin, who is the author of this wonderful memoir, Lost and Founder. Um, he's the founder of Moz and also the founder of Spark Turo more recently, um, and has written a ton of stuff, right, uh, about SEO, about all sorts of things, life as an entrepreneur, uh, blogs quite a bit. Um, uh, even on Moz's site, I notice a lot of the older um, blogs that you had written are still up and, and, and out there. Um, but I in particular uh, enjoyed reading this memoir. I, I'm a big consumer of memoirs. If I was driving, I would have tried to get this on, uh, on audio so I could listen to it. And then usually you get an actor who, who reads it. And then I would, you know, when I feel meet you, I'm like, Hey, you don't sound like yourself, <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, good but, news. Uh, Penguin Random House decided that my voice was good enough to record my own book. And so it's really me reading the book. Darn. I, now, I, now I really wish that I had, uh, had gotten it on, on audio, but, but welcome Rand. Um, this, this book, um, you mentioned, you call it a painfully honest field guide to the startup world. And in there you have a lot of what, what you call, call pro tips. Um, yeah. and in the, you know, what I like about this is that when, when students are exposed or, you know, potential entrepreneurs are exposed to people who have experience in the business. Um, I think they often get a very, uh, you know, rose tinted picture of what it's like to be, be a founder. You know, when, when we invite people to come and speak at, at the school, uh, you know, it's usually we, we, we go for the people who have had the biggest companies that have blown up, you know, and, and, uh, and, and usually, you know, they'll talk about, oh, it was, you know, difficult at the beginning, but then, you know, everything opened up and. <laughs> And so I, I thought that was great about this book is that, you know, you, you talk about, Hey, you know, this is, this is, this is a difficult life, right? There's a lot that, that goes into it. And there's a lot that, you know, no one's ever going to tell you. And that's kind of, was that the motivation for, for writing the book? Um, it was certainly one of the big motivations. I think the other big one was the frustration with survivorship bias and frankly, no, no offense intended, but, um, the venture capital world's propaganda, um, around how entrepreneurship can work, should work, has to work, you know, um, my, my sort of ongoing, um, infuriation with that cultures, especially Silicon Valley tech culture around so many issues, but, but in particular, this idea that if you don't raise venture capital, try and build a unicorn or die trying you're not playing with the big kids. You're a intentionally pejorative lifestyle business, right? And, and they use all sorts of tactics to insult and demean entrepreneurs and small businesses and folks who participate in ecosystems that are not directly helping their portfolios make money. Uh, and that's, it's, it's very transparent once you get outside of it, but it's really hard to see from the inside. Right. And you know, you, when you first. Uh, got venture capital. You mentioned in the book that when you first start getting venture capital, you actually learned quite a bit because the, the venture capitalists, um, you know, they, 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 they taught you a lot about, oh, yeah. about building and growing a business. You know, there's a lot of pressure on you, but there was a lot of kind of knowledge transfer. Um, absolutely. I think, I think it's a, um, you know, that ecosystem is, uh, designed to sort of help elevate and and absolutely educate, um, in, in a very particular kind of way, uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and, and founders and also teams, right. And, uh, boards of directors and folks who participate in that ecosystem through, you know, all sides, right. People who teach classes at colleges and, and professors, uh, folks in the, you know, science fields, um, folks in, uh, accounting and legal and software and support services. Uh, it is a, it is a big, powerful, you know, multi-trillion dollar ecosystem, uh, and has a, a, a commensurate cultural pull attached to it. So do you think that the, the, the kind of mythology that is being perpetuated by the kind of venture capital universe is, is the, is the main kind of negative consequence of that, um, an oversupply of, of folks who are 
chasing after this dream? Is, is it that it, it, the goal is to make people overconfident and overestimate their probability of success? And, and so that, you know, you just suck in a lot of, uh, a lot of intelligent people and a lot of effort, uh, even though the, 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 the prospects might be uh, more grueling than they anticipate. Yeah, I think that the, so th there are three outcomes that I really dislike from the venture backed world. Um, those are, ooh, it's tough, it's tough to put them in any order. So this is in no order particularly, but, um, the first one is biasing entrepreneurs and founders and people who want to join startups and participate in that ecosystem, you know, just as employees or, or as customers even. Um, that there is one correct way to build a company, right? And that way is to raise, you know, a seed round and a series A and a series B and a series C and a series D and go public or get acquired for, you know, something north of, I don't know, $500 million or a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. and, and become a unicorn or mm -hmm. to make that attempt and, and die trying. I don't mean die personally, but um, to sacrifice much of your, time, energy, attention, sort of the rest of your life, uh, in pursuit of trying to become one of those, because that is the, the sort of only worthwhile goal. So that that's one outcome I really dislike. I, I disagree fundamentally with both sides of that, uh, equation, right? That a, there's only one way to do it. Um, and it's, and that's the venture way and B that, um, that is a worthwhile trade in terms of one's life and effort, um, and that entrepreneurial success of at venture scale is the most correct, um, or most laudatory and worthy of the goals. The second outcome I really dislike is, um, the massive way in which it furthers income inequality, right? So I mean that le a little bit less in the way that it's often brought up in politics, where it's sort of individual income inequality. And a little bit more in the way that macroeconomists might look at it in um, business outcomes, right? So essentially, you know, Google and Facebook and Amazon exist because they were able to, yes, create a lot of value, but also suck a ton of the wind and oxygen out of the room in terms of small and medium businesses that previously existed and even multiple large companies that existed and were competitive in a market. Um, and I think that those competitive markets lead to more innovation. They lead to more employment. They lead to more people, uh, having more job opportunities. They lead to, um, a greater distribution of the wealth rather than a concentration of wealth because monopolies fundamentally concentrate wealth. And unfortunately, venture capitalists are sort of looking for, for monopolies, right? They want to fund companies that have the potential to become monopolies in their space, not just market leaders, but. 50, 60, 70 plus percent ownership in that space. Um, and, and preferably in very big spaces. So the incentives kind of suck for the rest of society. Um, that's the second one. And then the third one of course is who gets funding. And it is Gregory, you know, this almost exclusively people who look like you and I. Uh, I'm still and, waiting for and, my first check. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> and, and it is. It is brutal. I mean, we are talking about more, um, what was it? More men named John, uh, more funding going to men named John over the last 20 years than all women combined. Um, we are talking about, uh, less than 1% of all venture funding going to any founding team with a black team member. <laughs> We are talking about boards of directors that are, uh, 85% plus men. And that, that's not just true for the boards of directors of the companies that are invested in, but also of the venture capitalists themselves, right? Which is an incredibly white and white and Asian, uh, male dominated culture, um, and very geographically specific, right? It's almost exclusively a few hot spots, sort of Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, London. Um, yeah. And what, and one of the ways that this manifests itself, you talk about the math, right? The math that the VCs go through, right? Which is, um, they expect, uh, the majority of their investments to go South. And so the ones that are left, they, they, they really need them to be, uh, you know, hits out of the, out of the ballpark, so to speak. And so they're not, they're not content to take a, 
a 2x or a 3x return on, on their investment. Um, uh, do you think that um, there's a model out there where you could maybe have a higher hit rate uh, with, you know, lesser returns? Or is it necessarily, you know, you, since everything's going to be a, a monopoly or a failure, you, you know, that's, that's a logic that, that makes sense for the VCs to pursue? Is there an alternative kind of VC I, yeah, model so where I, you can- I obviously, I obviously believe that there is, and, and plenty of folks have modeled this out, right? So folks who are in alternative forms of capital, uh, whatever, you know, ClearBank and Earnest VC and Village Capital and Indie.VC and Tiny Seed Fund, um, and, and lots more angels and, and folks like that, right? Have, have essentially said, well, what if instead of 98% of the companies that we invest in failing, what if it's more like the restaurant industry's success rate and only half of them fail? Could we conceivably build a portfolio that is more right, broadly successful and they don't need to be 10x or 50x exits, they can be lots of two to five x exits? Or what if they don't need to exit? What if they pay dividends when they have profits? What if that's how the fund makes money, right? So the, these kinds of alternatives are emerging, but only in the last few years, they're still an incredibly tiny sector um, and uh, of this you know, broader ecosystem. And very few entrepreneurs are aware of them. Very few people sort of um, talk about those in the same breath that they do venture capital. Uh, I think that's a mistake. I think, I think that we should be looking at those kinds of alternatives. And I'm also... Um, not, I think the venture capital field is very scared because when they look across all the venture capital portfolios, only 5% of venture funds meet their return targets. So, you know, you take any 15 year period and you look at all the venture funds out there, 5% meets their, meet their target returns, which is essentially, it's a little over three X, I think of, of how much they raise from their LPs. Um, then you've got another 15% that are doing two to three X. So almost meeting their target requirements, but not quite beating what would have happened if the LPs had put the money into the public markets, for example. And then you have a bunch that are zero to two uh, X and they're you know, really not, not meaning it at all. And you know, what's weird, many venture capitalists are able to convince their LPs that their mm -hmm. next fund will be different. Yep. Right. And, and some of them are right because it's kind of a crapshoot. Right. If you get into whatever it is, Uber or Airbnb or, you know, Facebook or something. Yeah. You could absolutely, that one company could make up for 300 bad investments that you made. I say bad investments, right? You know, you know, what's so weird about this when we talk about like, oh, well, one success makes up for 300 bad investments. That's 300 founding teams who had a really bad bunch of years. Right. They worked their tails off. They probably sacrificed a ton of things. They probably convinced a ton of people to join those companies and, and build them with them. And those people also, uh, were paid less than market rates and took stock options and didn't have much of a return. And they all built products that their customers now can get used. It's just a lot of really nasty outcomes, right? So the whole model, I just don't like it at all. Um. Yeah, that's, I, I'm not sure exactly how venture capitalists are like, yeah, I like doing this. This is great. Well, I understand why venture capitalists do it, but, but I don't understand as much why the LPs do it because you, you know, you're absolutely right. The returns to, to the LPs is, 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 is surprisingly low. And I think when you talk to the LPs themselves, uh, even very sophisticated ones at pension funds, I don't think they, 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 they really understand kind of the, 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 the returns of, of of their investments. Well, and I mean, to be fair to those folks, right, the, um, the savviness and levels of charisma and social capital and, uh, network effects and old boys club on upon old boys club upon old boys club that is built up around, um, the venture industry, um, is can be pretty hard to see through, right? So if I, you know, if I'm a pension fund for whatever firefighters fund, or I'm a, you know, wealthy individual family fund, and I see this, um, impressive investment group coming to me and they've got all these, you know, whatever 
things on their CV that m- make them sound super credible. And they talk about how they, you know, got this exciting portfolio and gosh, it's kind of sexy and fun to be in it. And lots and lots of people are, and boy, you know, our, it would be great to have our money participating in these sorts of exciting ecosystems that get lots of press and coverage. And you know, there's, I think a lot of it is prestige and non purely financial, purely logical considerations. So it, you can understand what happens. Well, as a founder, taking VC money might be problematic, but it, it's certainly not as bad as uh, your original method of, of financing <laughs> a business. Uh, you know, so maybe, it, and you start off the book describing, uh, you know, your early days as, as an entrepreneur and, and uh, you know, you dropped out of college, uh, you know, like other folks like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, you're in good company. Um, but, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that experience. Cause I think that was clearly a, a very important experience in your life and, and helped to shape a lot of, uh, everything that came afterwards. Yeah. Um, so By we, the way, did you, did you ever, did, did, did you ultimately pay back all that debt? I'm presuming you did not file for bankruptcy and, and actually yeah, managed we didn't, to, we didn't file for bankruptcy. And I mean, realistically we, we could and should have, that would have been the logical move, mm-hmm. um, so for folks, yeah, for folks who are listening and don't have context, um, my mom and I started the, the business that eventually became Moz, um, which was a, you know, now a, I don't know, 50 ish million dollar a year software company with, you know, a bunch of venture capital investment, blah, 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 blah. But the early days of starting that were as a consulting firm, building websites, and we made every mistake in the book and we had you know, almost a hundred thousand dollars in loans and debt, uh, that we owed. And then we stopped being able to make the minimum payments on a bunch of those. And so in, you know, six months or less, we had half a million dollars in debt because of the penalties. Um, and we could, we should have declared bankruptcy, but we were, we were really scared that they would take my parents. Um, uh, my, my parents had bought my maternal grandmother's house. And they were like, my mom was super worried about that. And we never told my dad to whom my mom is still married, um, that we had any of this debt. Right. So there's just all these, you know, just this insane pressure and, and stress and debt collectors coming after us. And, uh, you know, I was living with my girlfriend, Geraldine, who's now my wife. Um, and, and we, you know, she was paying all of our bills and the rent. Um, and I was like, honey, look, I got us a bottle of wine. Cause that's what I can afford to contribute to this partnership. Um, and it was, it was very, very rough times. So we did not declare bankruptcy. We ended up, you know, my mom basically called up all the debt collectors and all the credit card companies and loans, et cetera, and, you know, made deals with them. So, oh, well, we owe you 50 grand, but the initial sum was only 8,000. How about we give you 10,000 and you'll write us off. And so, you know, for, I don't know, 12, 15 years, my credit report looked awful. I couldn't buy a house or a car or anything. Um, but eventually things worked out. Well, one of the lessons, I mean, there are a couple of lessons that came, came out of that. I mean, one had to do with, uh, your, your dedication to transparency and, and honesty. And maybe we could talk about that. But, but the other thing was that, um, in those early days, you know, you had a consulting business and you, you realize very quickly that the consulting is just not, you know, it's not scalable. It's, it's not fundable. It's, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult business. And so you shifted to, uh, to software, um, or, you know, the way you just and, and, and then realized how great a business consulting really is. <laughs> well, t- well, tell us about that. Right. Cause, um, you know, when yeah. you're talking about valuations, if, if it's a, you know, if it's a product business, if it's a SaaS business, right, you get massive multiples. If you're you know, consulting, it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, get any kind of value really. It seems that way. And yet, um, of my friends who have had successful exits and I'm, I'm lucky to have a wide network of, of of friends and colleagues, um, vastly more have become comfortably wealthy through their consulting businesses Mm -hmm. than have had a successful outcome with a product backed startup. Um, and that's no surprise consulting businesses are some of the longest lived, uh, on average, according to us census data businesses in, um, in the field, right? So I I think the average survival rate at five years for a 
company that either has tried to raise venture, uh, tried to raise angel that leads to venture or is venture backed is, um, a little under 15%. Uh, the survival rate for a restaurant, for example, is about 50%, I think it's 51%, 52%. It's probably lower because of COVID now, but that was, that was true a couple of years ago. And for a consulting business, it's over 70, right? So th those businesses, you know, Greg, you and I start up a consultancy and we're making money. We have profits. We don't have a lot of expenses. We can run it for 20 years and, oh gosh, we sure made a lot of money doing that. And we can have a startup, you know, that we, we try four or five startups, maybe over the course of 20 years. What are the odds that one of them turns successful? Low, extremely low. Um, just statistically speaking, right? That's, that's how it goes. In your book, you talk about, uh, passion, you know, that's another thing that we hear a lot. Um, you know, at, at business school, when people come in to speak to students, it's, you know, you got to follow your passion. And if you're passionate about something, you know, then that's the necessary ingredient for you to be successful and it can take you to the top and, you know, you got to be passionate about what you do and, and you, you, you maybe offer some cautionary words around, uh, pa passion and, and say, maybe, you know, passion might not be a uh, sufficient, uh, skill set as far as to, especially be a leader and to be a, to be a CEO. And you, you, you were the CEO of, of Moz for, for most of its existence, right? When did you, tra you transferred, was it five years ago you, you, you passed on the CEO? Yeah. Position? Yeah. About, uh, I guess about six, six years ago, I left, mm -hmm. uh, I stepped down and then I, I left the company in 2018. Mm-hmm. So what, what's the role of, of, you know, should, should students and young people, you know, follow this, like, Hey, you know, follow your passion, uh, uh, exclusively, or, or is it more complicated than that? Um, I, I don't think that doing things that you're passionate about is a bad idea. However, I would say, I think it's a shades of gray situation. Um, and this is true for almost everything in life, right? The older you get, the more you're like, Ooh, this thing that I thought was black and white has shades of gray. What a, what a surprising. Well, hopefully we all learn that, um, the, you know, the reality that I would say is your passion does not need to be how you make money. You can have a passion that is separate and apart from how you make money. And it is fine to pursue, um, something that is financially rewarding and, you know, gives you what you are looking for from a professional, you know, sort of money earning, uh, element of your life. There's nothing wrong with that. Many, many people do it. I, I don't see any problem with saying, Hey, I may, you know, whatever, uh, I'm a software engineer, but you know, my passion is, I, I don't know, fiction writing. Wonderful. Great. Use your software engineering, uh, background to give yourself a life where you are comfortable and write your fiction on the side. And, and maybe at some point in your life, things will, you know, the tables will turn and, and the fiction writing will be how you make your income as well. Wonderful. But you don't need to exclusively have, have one or the other. And I think that, um, there's this mythology, uh, that is driven by a, again, you know, that same element of Silicon Valley culture that I, that I despise, which is that your whole life must be consumed by your work and your business. Um, and that is, that is not only, um, untrue, it's also counterproductive. The, um, the emerging research on this is, is that in fact, putting 30 or 40 hours of, um, very thoughtful, high quality work a week into a project, into a, a company is almost certainly both more sustainable and more likely to be successful than 80 hour weeks. And I don't think this should surprise anyone, right? So students in particular know that if you are well rested and well fed and in good shape, and you know, you've been getting your whatever, eight and a half hours of sleep for the last week, gosh, it's weird how your test performance scores are so much higher than the same person taking the same test with, you know, four and five hours of sleep and, you know, uh, all these other issues. And what is the job of a startup founder, right? What is the, what is the most important element to me? That is make great decisions. 
It's not about, you know, did I write the best blog post or was like this email perfectly composed or did I reply to all my emails within five minutes or less, or I don't know, send a bunch of tweets or write the most code. No, it's, did I make the best decisions on whatever, who to hire and let go of, uh, uh, where, where to contract things, uh, what direction to take the strategy of the product, uh, what to do in marketing and not. That's the really crucial part of a leader's job. And if you're going to make those decisions, you should put yourself in the best possible place to do that. And the best way to do that is to sleep well, eat well, uh, be well rested, not overwork yourself. Let your mind do what human minds do, which is work on problems in the background while you are having fun making your meals or watching your Netflix or playing your video games or spending time with your loved ones. That's, uh. It's, it's not just my advice, right? There's, there's a lot of good science around this. Yeah. Well, and the skills you talk about, you know, making good decisions and so forth, th these, these are, you know, when you talk about management in your book, you say, uh, management is not, is, is a skill. It's not a prize, right? Leader, lead, if you, and, and yet everyone, when they work in an organization, they, they feel like they have to work their way up into uh, a position of, of, of leadership. They have to work themselves up into a position of, of, of management. And so if you're an individual contributor, you know, and you're, you're a software engineer and so forth, you know, you, you believe that that's, that's really what you're doing it for. Um, I think in, in Moz, you, you, you said, you made it clear that that's not always the, the path that you should be looking for. Yeah. How did you come I mean, to that this is, decision? Yeah. This is a really pernicious problem across not just the venture world, right. But, but all of the business world, which is that in order to gain, you know, power, influence, prestige, um, in, in order to build up a more, <laughs> I don't know what, how to put this sort of a safer position in your industry, right? A safer position in your career, you usually need to manage people. Um, and that, it, that sucks, right? That is, that is no fun, but I'm also very empathetic to the fact that that's true for a lot of people and, and in a lot of worlds. So I don't want to discount or dismiss that. Um, what I would say is that if you are the founder of a company, if you are the CEO, or if you're on the board of directors, you don't have to live that way. You don't have to craft a business that way. Mm -hmm. You can do what, you know, Microsoft started doing in the 1980s and nineties with their, with exclusively with their technical team, which was essentially, they recognized, huh, there's a lot of people here who should not be managing anyone. Mm -hmm. However, they are very talented. And if they're offered management positions elsewhere, they might leave. So let us create a track for individual contributors to progress in terms of their influence, in terms of their uh, titles, in terms of the prestige inside the organization, and in terms of their uh, pay and, and reward. And Microsoft did just that, and Google copied it. Um, and Google is generally get, gets a lot of credit for doing it, e e even though sort of um, uh, more popular at Microsoft before that. But we did that at Moz, and we said, why is this limited to software engineers? just because they're in, you know, high demand, like let's do it for everyone. Let's do it for customer service team members. Let's do it for, for product folks and designers. Let's do it for marketers. Let's do it for folks on the finance team. There's no reason that that sort of an individual contributor track that upgrades pay and influence and prestige at, at every part of the organization shouldn't exist. That is, it absolutely should. Um, and I think that, you know, that experiment uh, was, was something we started in the last few years that I was CEO, it, it started to go well. And then, um, management's position on it kind of changed after I left, but, uh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I have seen some folks, I, I still get emails from people who read that part of the book and are like, oh my God, we did this in my, even agencies, a lot of agencies mm -hmm. have done it with their, um, individual consultants on their team and seeing that it has a, a great effect on retention and, uh, work quality. And there are a couple other things that, that are standard practices in tech startups that you question. Uh, one of which is, you know, this, this reliance on, on growth hacking, right? I mean, I think if you, you know, everyone I know who's in a startup is like, Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta figure out a way to, you know, make the numbers look good and so forth. And, and, and you, you kind of, I mean, if you watch on, what is it, uh, on, on, um, Silicon Valley, the TV show, I think they have an episode where they, they spoof that. Um, and then one of the other things is, you know, the MVP kind of obsession with MVP. And you, you tell a couple stories about how, you know, MVPs can backfire 
and uh, and and you really have to think a little more carefully about you know your release and maybe Reed Hoffman's advice is not always the one that you should follow. Yeah, um, so I'll I'll tackle the latter one first. I um, I have launched plenty of MVPs in my career. I have had almost none of them ever be very successful, and I have launched several what I would call more fully baked, well-tested, high quality. Everyone internally is worried that we waited way too long to launch products. And those tend to do pretty well. Um, and I think a, a lot of what's going on here is the difference between an MVP when you are a tiny company that's just trying to validate the market and has almost mm. no marketing reach or people paying attention to you versus when you have a bigger profile or you're at a bigger company where people are paying a lot more attention and you have a large mailing list and you have a lot of people pay, um, um, you know, who are going to check out every launch that you do and see what it's about. Uh, and at those, at those more substantive, you know, far reaching marketing campaign sizes, um, an MVP isn't just going to fall flat. It will often damage your brand reputation for a long time. You know, the example, one of the examples I use in the book is let's say Tesla launches a really crappy MVP version of their first sedan, you know, whatever that was, 20, 2009, 2008, 20, 2008 something like that. I, I don't think that's going to go well for that company. In fact, I think it probably would have filled that business before it even got off the ground. I don't think the Obama administration would have even offered them the loans that they did, right? They, they had they to have an crashing, incredibly yeah. exciting product, you know, a massive game changer of a product in order to be successful. Um, and that's because there was so much hype and attention directed toward them. If Tesla had been a no-name company with no one paying attention and it had sort of released its first vehicle to a few dozen of it, you know, close friends and associates. And it was a crappy thing. And they were like, well, here's how you can improve it. Fine. That, that's probably going to work great. And so I think you just have to consider which stage you're at before you decide how minimally viable is viable. Um, and, and my, you know, my suspicion is that for most companies that have any attention being paid to them, and a lot of entrepreneurs who do too, it's a better bet to build up your marketing and get that, you know, big email list before you launch and to privately beta test before you release and use that as your MVP, but don't let it out publicly into the market until it is really extraordinary. Right. And so I, I, I frame it as an MVP versus an EVP with the exceptionally viable product, um, being what I'm more in favor of in most competitive market segments. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you, if you have to wait until the product is more fully developed and you know, where do you get your intelligence from? You've got to, you got to somehow probe your, your customer base and so forth. And I think in, in, in the book, you tell this story, which I, I've, I don't think I've ever heard of a similar story from anyone in your position, but, um, I just loved it. And I think it was something that, that people should start doing. There should be even a TV show about it where you swapped places with one of your, of your, your, your customers. I mean, first of all, like where on earth did you get that idea and why on earth did this idea move anything pa past anything, but just a drunken conversation and, uh, and, and have you ever heard of anyone else doing it? Tell us the story. Sure. Yeah. So this is, um, my friend, Will Reynolds, who runs a, uh, fairly sizable consultancy in Philadelphia called Sierra interactive and Sierra interactive was a, had been a Moz customer for a long time. And many of their, um, you know, consultants use our, used our SEO software to sort of, you know, rank track their clients and improve all their, um, keyword targeting, that kind of thing. And so it was, um, relatively late, I think in my tenure, maybe about a year and a half before I stepped down as CEO, uh, I will, and I got together at a bar in Philadelphia. We'd been friends for a number of years. Um, and we had had this crazy idea to like swap places that, that he would go be CEO of Moz for a week. And I would be CEO of Seer Interactive for a week. And we were like, gosh, you know, who, who else gets this opportunity to do this? So I, I emailed my board of directors and said, Hey, like I want, 
I want to make this happen. And I would like you all to just give me the supportive authority to say, yep, sure. We'll see you for a week. Um, and it was, it was kind of on a fun lark, but oh man, what an intense experience. First off, just trading email addresses with another human being and living inside their inbox and having them in, live inside yours. That is intense like that it takes a huge amount of trust a very very difficult um switching time zones was also really hard for me i'm a crazy night owl wills is super um up early kind, kind of guy and he's on the east coast and i'm on the west coast so uh that was that was no fun but yeah we did everything we you know he um went to some of my entrepreneur meetups and stuff here in seattle i um went to his nonprofit board stuff and uh it was you know, very, very full days for both of us. We both had had at the time executive assistants who kind of helped manage that. But the, the big takeaway that I talk about in Lost and Founder is the empathy for your customer, right? I got to sit with Sears team for a full week, build a bunch of relationships with people who, you know, lived and breathed the work that they were doing with our product and seeing it, a lot of gaps between what we should be doing and what we were not doing, um, and seeing why, you know, why their consultants were at the time already switching to different products in the market. Uh, and that was a very eye opening experience. I agree with you. I think, I think more folks should do something like that. It's mm -hmm. probably pretty hard to get your CEOs to agree to it, mm -hmm. but I think, I think you could probably do it at greater scale with more people further down in an organization. You know, there's no reason that a marketer from Moz or someone from Moz's product team couldn't go to Philadelphia for a week and, you know, sort of do the job of a consultant there. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you know, bring someone from Sears team into Moz's product meetings and engineering meetings for a week. I, mm -hmm. I, I can't see a reason why that shouldn't be an industry standard. Yeah, I mean, I, I could totally see a reality TV show built on this, right? You know, there's that one where <laughs> the boss... I think this is part of the problem is it feels a little reality TV show, right? It's like, oh, Rand moved into Will's apartment and or, or house and Will moved into Rand's house. And like, um, Geraldine and I both lived at, at Will's house, took care of his dog. And like, it, <laughs> um, just no, the whole nine yards, like everything was... Um, switched over. So it was a little reality TV-esque. And I think I, I almost wonder if that, uh, just memification downplayed a little bit of the raw business and educational mm -hmm. value, but I, I cannot, uh, recommend it enough. I would love to be able to do it at some point again in my career once Spark Toro sort of gets to an, a different point. Well, if you want to come and teach my classes for a week, you know, we can, we can work it out, but, Fun. um, but you know, you, you, you talk about some other product development stories, you know, where empathy, ha you know, was, was a problem. And then, you know, later it was sort of a, um, a solution. Um, how does, you know, if you're in a company f for a long time and you're working on a product, you're, you got your head down and, and, you know, you're doing what you think is the right thing. Uh, and then later you, you find out that that's not really what the customers wanted. What are some techniques that you can use to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that you really are listening and that you really are getting the right feedback and the right information, not, not just from customers, but also from, from your employees, right? Right. When you're a CEO, yeah, uh, you need to get feedback. Um, so first off, I think the power distance challenge inside an organization between a CEO and their employees is both harmful and incredibly challenging. I'm not sure I've ever seen, um, a great solution to that problem. I've encountered it a lot. I've heard people complain about it a ton. I have never heard a truly, um, prescriptive solution. So I think you're going to need to find another guest who hopefully knows more about that and, and has a solution. Um, I, I experienced it tremendously when I stepped down from the CEO role within six months, the types of conversations that I had with my mm -hmm. coworkers rather than, you know, people reporting to me, uh, was like a 180 degree difference. It was just, and it, and it was relatively infuriating too, right? I, I appreciated the transparency and also I just wanted to grab them and be like, why, why didn't you tell me yeah. you, you could have said something and I, I don't have an answer for why that is, but I also, 
you know, I have a lot of empathy for folks um, in that position because I think that most CEOs, most managers are not um, making themselves as available or making it clear that the repercussions are far outweighed by the value of having those talks. So really tough. I will I mean, say one, one, one an end around a way to circumvent this problem is to stay small. Mm -hmm. So I, I almost, not never, but almost never had this problem when Moz was smaller than 50 people. And I had this problem every hour of every day once Moz was over a hundred people. So, you know, there, there's a lot of advantages to a small company in this facet. I think this is one of the reasons, you know, Gregory, you mentioned like, Rand, you were so, you know, so much of your career and your transparency is a reaction to those early years of struggle and near bankruptcy and that kind of thing. I think a lot of my Spark Toro experience is a reaction to what I experienced at Mama's and the frustrations that I had with building a larger company. So Spark Toro is myself, my co-founder, Casey, and a bunch of contractors and agencies. And I, I love that. I, it works really well. Uh, your other question that I thought was actually an excellent one, um, and that I do have a great answer for was how do you make sure that you're paying attention to your customers and listening to real feedback that they're giving without having to go through like a CEO swap that I have a really good, uh, at least something that's worked really well for me. So Casey and I did a long beta for Spark Toro before it launched, we gathered a ton of feedback. We got surveys and interviews, phone calls, and, you know, lots of chats, like, like what you and I are having right now, demoing the product, like showing it to tons of people. And we also didn't trust ourselves entirely to be fully honest about what that feedback was. It's just the two of us, like, could we identify all those things? So we hired a consulting firm, uh, called Elevate, um, Hey, it's HeyElevate.com, uh, Claire and Gia, um, and they, they put together, they basically analyzed all the data that we had from all of our customers, all the feedback and surveys and comments, emails, et cetera. And then synthesize that for us into, Hey, here are your primary, primary problems. And we basically spent like three months kind of fixing those things up, things that we had not really seen or, uh, grokked fully when we got them as feedback and turning that into the product we eventually launched in, in 2020. I thought it was great. I would do it a hundred times again. Like I, I don't think I will ever, um, not do that in the future. It's just so, so valuable. And you know, I don't know, maybe we spent 12 K or something, but how valuable was that? That's like blind spot insurance really. Yeah, it really, it really is. Right. So, you know, maybe you have no blind spots. Almost certainly you do, right? Mm. Almost certainly when you hire people, especially people who've seen a bunch of these before who do this for a living, all they do is look at feedback and see, oh yeah, I've seen this type of feedback before. We solved it this way at this company. We solved it this way at this company. We solved it this way at this company. Ooh, the transformative. This is, this is one of the reasons if I could include a new chapter in Lost and Founder, it would be why you should use agencies and consultants for everything. Just throw it up online. We'll, we'll find it. <laughs> I, I do. I have a blog post about it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, you know, you talk a lot about culture and if we go back to that blind spot that you had as, as CEO, right. And, um, you mentioned this story about you had a toxic employee, right. Someone who was in a very influential position and they, you know, they, they were toxic in, in a bunch of ways and you never found out until after the employee was, was, was gone. Um, and, and so th this was, I think, disturbing to you, not just that there was this toxic employee, but that you didn't, no one told you. Right. No one, yeah. no one came up to you and said anything. So, so, you know, you, you decided to make it well, two things, right. You wanted to be very, very careful about who you hired going forward, but then you also needed to open up the, the, the communication channels. So, um, you, you talked about these core, core values and you said core value is something you're willing to, you're willing to sacrifice profit for them. And if you're not willing to sacrifice profit for them, they're not, they're not core values. So how did you come up with this, the, you know, the tag fee, core values and how did you roll them out and how did you, uh, I had a conversation with, uh, Frederic Lalou, uh, I don't know if you know him, uh, reinventing organizations. And he said the role of the CEO is basically the one who holds the line and, uh, you know, makes sure that, 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 that the culture is, is, is supported. So can you tell us that story about the tag fee and how it came about? Sure. 
Um, so tag and you, fee by the way, a, and have you borrowed tag? Fee, do you have tag fee now in 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 your new company? In Spark Toro, no, we don't. Uh, we don't. We um, Casey and I had a conversation about. I'll I'll let me tell this story and then I'll tell that one. Um, so uh, at Moz in its early years, pro- there were probably seven or eight of us. I think when we first came up with tag fee, uh, it was created by my wife Geraldine. Um, as part of a contract project that, that she did. Essentially, we, you know, I had read this book, um, Good to Great, which is a, a very popular kind of business book. It was given to me by my venture investor, Michelle Goldberg from Ignition Partners. And, um, you know, one of the things that was identified in, in great companies versus just good companies was that they have these core values that they live up to. So, you know, we decided, okay, well, let's follow this framework and, and build our own. And Geraldine essentially came, uh, took all of the kind of work that we had done around it, discussions and topics and sort of, you know, making a bunch of lists of adjectives that we wanted to describe us at Moz and that we thought were representative of who we were and what we wanted to be in the world. Uh, and she synthesized that down into these six, um, core values and turned it into the acronym tag fee and wrote up the descriptions of transparency, authenticity, generosity, fun, empathy, and the exception to the rule. Um, and those, yeah, those stuck with the company for a long time. A lot of folks in the marketing world and in, in Moz's orbit, uh, resonated with them. They, um, they were used by us in a bunch of different places. We used it in recruiting. So in how we talked about joining the team, we used it in our performance reviews, right? So how are you sort of graded? We used it in decision-making um, around product and marketing and events and strategy and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's very, very baked into the organization. And then I think, you know, towards the end of my, um, tenure as CEO, and certainly as new leadership, uh, came in, it became a little bit more of a plaque on the wall kind of thing. Um, cause I think, you know, new, new leadership had their own values that, that they brought with them and they, um, Tag fee had been around, but it became more of an anachronism. And so, um, I, I encouraged when I was on the board, encouraged, um, the leadership to sort of come up with a new, uh, set of their own values that, that they thought better represented them. I, I don't know if that's been done, but, uh, I hope so. And yeah, it, it's a, again, got really a lot harder over a hundred people than, mm-hmm. than sub 50. Um, but I would, I would do it again if, and when Spark Toro starts to grow, but I probably wouldn't do it at the size that Casey and I are at now. It just, it feels a little of the combination of grandstandy and unnecessary. Right? You're finding yeah. a culture when you only have two people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And we're, we're both remote and we're pretty comfortable yeah. with each other and, you know, maybe a little more mature as well. So we have, um, we certainly have a culture, but it is a very hands-off light one. And that's all that's needed when it's so small. Now, uh, towards the end of the book, you talk a lot about, um, you know, transparency, you talk about vulnerability, you, you talk about, well, you, you referenced the work at Google about, uh, psychological safety and, you know, comfort with, um, uh, difficult conversations. Um, but then you also tell the story about how, you know, you, you, uh, at your, I guess it was your final board of directors meeting where you, 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 you were maybe a little too, uh, I don't know, um, uh, impulsive or, uh, transparent, uh, in the moment. Um, how do you, how do you reconcile those? I mean, you, you know, you, 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 you regretted having behaved the way you did at the board of directors meeting, but on the other hand, you, you really emphasize the importance of, you know, feeling comfortable being who you are and expressing your, 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 your beliefs in an open, in an open yeah. context. I mean, this is a, this is one of those reflections and, and for folks who haven't read the book and are, are wondering sort of what, what you're talking about, Gregory, um, full context is that, so I was on the board for several years after this, it, this one incident that you're, I, okay. I think you're referring <laughs> to, um, but the board of directors was basically considering how to handle, uh, letting go a large portion of Maz's staff, I think 25% or so, um, of the company. And that was very, very painful. You know, it sucked for everyone. Um, I had never been part of a major layoff before in my career. And, uh, there was a discussion of how generous to make severance. And I was, 
there's no, yeah, there's no way to sugarcoat. I was a dick about it. Just, you know, I, I was so sure I was right and that I was the morally upstanding person. And so I, you know, insultingly like pointed my finger at all my board members and was like, you know, you're a millionaire, you're a millionaire. Have you ever been fired from a job? No, I didn't think so. Moving on, you know, someone was like, okay, Rand, is this necessary? Is this? And I was like, shut up. We are doing this. <laughs> Move on to the next person. That insulting people, demeaning them. I don't know. Maybe it makes for good TV, but it, it was really um, very off-putting. I think even, even if in the aggregate and the abstract um, and, and at the core level, the board members agreed with me. Right. And, and eventually they did, right. Like they, they went with a severance package that, that I wanted. That's not the way to build relationships or further relationships. It is not the way to treat people who are being perfectly respectful and are just expressing other opinions. Um, so that is, that is why I regret it. Not because the outcome was not good or that it, you know, in retrospect, it's like, oh, you know, Rand looks like the. I don't know, whatever, you know, Bernie Sanders type <laughs> hero trying to give money to everybody instead of, you know, congregating it. And the board members, you know, reasoning was not, oh, I don't want to be generous because screw those people that were letting go. It was, hey, we need to also make sure that the business has enough capital to sustain potential problems in the future. Like you don't want to let 27% of the pe people go with a generous severance package and then have to let the other 73% go in a year. That's not, mm -hmm. you know, that's not the optimal thing to do. So, um, this, I think it speaks to maturity. It speaks to emotional intelligence. It speaks to not getting, um, your sense of righteousness confused with your ability to impact change positively. Mm -hmm. So talk about this, uh, Talk about psychological safety and how, you know, how companies, particularly companies, you know, when, when they get larger, how can they uh, maintain this environment where people can have open conversations, people can, can debate, people can give each other feedback, uh, and, and do so in a productive way. All right. I, I think first off that my experience here is relatively minimal. And I'm not sure I ever did an excellent job with it. So I don't know that I have superb advice on how large organizations can do it. I can speak to smaller teams and companies where you can build a system for, uh, grading your managers and, and incentivizing them to create psychological safety, uh, to recognizing the importance of that on the culture of the team that you build and on their ability to be productive and do their best work and how, uh, valuable that is to even purely capitalist financial outcomes, mm -hmm. um, and how badly it can misfire when you have even one person dragging down a team with, you know, sort of making everyone else feel uncomfortable or unsafe or unlistened to, um, that is uh, undoubtedly problematic. And, and you can, you can do this as a senior leader by essentially, um, promoting managers and leaders inside the company who have proven that they create those environments for their, for the people around them and who all those people say, yes, this person makes me feel this way. When I work with Gregory, I feel like I can tell him anything. And even if it reflects badly on me, he will understand, he will have empathy, he'll be forgiving, he'll help me find solutions. When I share and I'm in his presence, I feel safe. No matter whether that's something personal or something professional, it, he helps me to feel like I can share openly. And he helps exclude team members from conversations when they do not do that, right? So if we're in a group and that butthole engineer, um, is giving me a hard time. Gregory will call him out on it and he will, um, make sure that that doesn't happen again, that you can find people like that. You can promote them. You can reward them. You can incentivize them. You can make that part of their performance reviews. 
You can make it part of their compensation package and you should. Uh, I think that that's what, that's what a lot of this research has, has shown. Google themselves have, you know, really fallen apart in a few areas. One of, one of the areas that Google is just wailing on is, uh, artificial intelligence ethics and they are getting, you know, just decimated for it in the press right now and in, in, uh, their internal culture. And you can see the environment that they created there and the stories that are coming out about it and just how, how far they fell, um, fell down on their own metric in, in this, in this area. And I think that that comes from leadership around that team. Well, we went through this entire almost hour without even talking about SEO or <laughs> talking about, you know, the Google and Facebook, uh, kind of bottleneck in, um, in marketing. And, and kind of your, your attempts to help people navigate that and maybe, you know, work around it. Um, do, do you see, do you see this as a, as a kind of a, a, a battle between, you, you know, the folks who are trying to, you know, build businesses and, and, uh, and the, these large companies that are, you know, more or less standing in the way of getting access to customers. Uh, is there a way that, that people can build some bargaining power in this respect is, is, is it, is there a conflict of, of interests between the folks who want to reach customers and, and the, uh, the platforms that they have to work with? I mean, absolutely. Right. So, you know, Google and Facebook's incentives, Reddit's, YouTube's, Twitter's, LinkedIn's, right. Is keep people on our platform, only send them off when someone is paid to advertise to them. Uh, create more engagement and addiction over time so that we get more users and more of their time on that platform each, you know, each month. Um, and that is what their you know, boards of directors and investors expect. Uh, so the incentives are obviously at complete odds with my small business has a Facebook page and we're trying to share content about what we're up to. And we would like to earn engagement and get people checking that out and learning more about our small business. Um, so the way we, we do not have time to get into all the potential tactics and strategies around this, but we'll, you know, two things that I would say are, um, number one, don't build your home on rented land. Don't make your Facebook page or your Google maps page or your Twitter profile or your LinkedIn page or your YouTube channel or any of those. Don't make them your central home on the web and drive people to those places. Use all of those places to drive people back to your website and your email list, which are really the only two properties that you can control. Um, and even when it comes to email, I would not outsource to Substack or something like it. I would not, um, put, build my web content on or behind Patreon, right? I would set up my own website, uh, and, and home for that stuff and then potentially leverage those other channels. Um, that's. A challenging thing to do, but it is incredibly worthwhile. I, I think you will find, you know, statistically speaking, you'd rather have one customer, one potential customer's email address versus literally 500 new fans on Facebook, because you will be able to reach that one person with relative efficacy and ease. You will be able to do marketing of all different kinds with that email address versus that, that Facebook like, you know, that's going to get you, I think Facebook's average reach per page is 0.09% in 2021. So not great. Well, there's so much more we could talk about the, your, your, the time when you could have sold the company and didn't sell the company, right? Uh, the shifting of the CEO position. Um, uh, and again, we could probably talk for hours about first party customer data and, and all the rest, uh, marketing oh, yeah. channels, but I'm just going to reference all of your, uh, blog posts. I'm going to send everybody over to the website, but I, I want to tell people, Hey, if you want to have a, a fun memoir, um, even if you don't have any intention of doing anything in SEO or intending to be an entrepreneur or you know, dealing with venture capitalists, um, I think it's a real human story. I, I would recommend it lost and founder. And maybe if you listen to the DVD, uh, or the, uh, audio version, you'll get to hear Rand read it himself. <laughs> so thank you so much, Fran. I really appreciate you uh, joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Gregory. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 